program. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Stilton Bloom to Cambridge. Thank you very much also for your introduction and also Karis, thank you very much for the invitation or both of you. It's really nice to be here and an honor. Um, before starting, I want to ask whether this is okay or should we dim the lights a bit so you can see it better. Yeah. A lot will be about images. <laughs> Maybe yeah, you can turn this one off and then do that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, great. Yes. It, um, as Asif said, I'm a lecturer in Iranian Islamic art history and um, focus on the Persian arts of the book. Um, my new project is about um, fascinating paper uh, made in China, which is very nicely tinted and bright colors, which has um, gold painting and was used in Persian manuscripts. Um, and I'm very glad that I just learned um, that next academic year I will have a living room um, research uh, fellowship to work more on that. But um, today I wanted to talk about one of my other favorite um, topics also to fit in more with um, the literary focus of these series, which are illustrated manuscripts of Atar's Mantrotair, or the Conference of the Birds in, in English. And this was um, the topic of my PhD research. I completed my PhD dissertation 2016 in Bamberg, and um, the book deriving from this research will appear at Brill in the um, Archaeology of the Islamic World series, hopefully in 2020. Um, so this study about illustrated Mantrotel manuscripts aims for the first time to bring together all illustrated um, yeah, manuscripts of the Mantarotair to study them codicologically and I also would like to find out or wanted to find out where they are where they were produced, what kind of context and how and also why they were illustrated. And um, yeah this this kind of research, kind of a holistic research has not been done that often. Um, the Sean Ahmed project here in Cambridge gathers data, illustrations of Sean Ahmed manuscripts, but there are so many illustrated Sean Ahmed manuscripts that it wouldn't work to fit all of that into one monograph. Um, two other scholars have done uh, before me um, a similar kind of, of research. Priscilla Sujek studied illustrated manuscripts of Nizami's Khamse or a collection of his five um, long narrative poems, and Barbara Brent published a book in 20, 2002 um, about illustrated manuscripts of the Khamse of Amir Khosrow Dehlavi. Um, and both works were, yeah, really inspired my research. So today I would like to focus on 15th century illustrated manuscripts of the Mantel Teir. Um, as we will see, the 15th century is when the first manuscripts of the Mantarote were illustrated, and during the course of the 15th century, a pictorial cycle or pictorial program uh, developed. But at the end of the talk, we will also consider some later um, representations of the Mantarote. Yeah, in my uh, research, I found more than 50 or 40 illustrated Mantarote manuscripts. As, as you see here, most of them were um, produced in the 15th century. Um, I also looked at manuscripts, illustrated manuscripts of the Lisanate. The Lisanate is the uh, Chagatai Turkish adaptation by Mir Ali Shiyu Nawai um, of the Mantarote produced at the very end of the 15th century. And some of them are illustrated as well. Um, there is also the uh, Majelis Alushak, or the Assemblies of Lovers, um, produced also in Herat at the beginning of the 16th century by Ghazar Goyi. And it's, it contains two stories from the Mantarote, or the Conference of the Birds. 
um, really copies them one to one, and this copy is characteristic was also the reason why uh, Babur, the founder of the Mughal Empire, um, said it was not a good word that was very copious. He also said it was near to blasphemy because some of the uh, Sufis or lovers treated in this uh, hagiographical work were not considered to be real mystics by, um, by Babur. Then there are three manuscripts of the Divan of Hafez that are illustrated with scenes from the Mantarotej. Um, in one Ghazal, one short poem, Hafez um, refers to um, a substory of the Mantarotej, the story of Sheikh San'an, which we will hear about um, more in due course. So they were illustrated in the 16th and 17th century. And then, starting from the end of the 17th century, but much more during the Rajar period, 18th, 19th century, we find that this substory of Sheikh San'an um, travels out of the context of the book, is separated from the text, and is illustrated or represented on single sheet paintings, um, it's wall paintings, oil paintings, lacquer works, and also tile paintings, and representation on carpets. Good. Um, so before looking at the manuscripts themselves, I wanted to talk a bit about um, the work, the Conference of the Birds, and I'm sorry to all of those who are, who are already familiar with it. Um, the um, Mantarote is a Persian Masnavi poem, has an A-A-B-B-C-C -C rhyme scheme, so you can produce quite long poems with that. Um, was composed probably shortly after 1200 by Farid Adin Attar from Nishapur. And um, the work itself, the kind of the frame story, is about the mystical path to unity with the divine. And this path is symbolized by, by birds that are kind of the, the true souls that are finding God. And um, as true mystics, true Islamic Sufis, they have um, a Sufi sheikh. And for the birds, that's the hupo. That's the bird, small bird over here. It's brown and it has a crest on its head. And in Atar's um, yeah, poetical language, this crest signifies that the hupo is the legitimate leader of, of the birds. Um, so in this frame story on the path towards the divine, um, the hupo, yeah, is not only the leader, but he also tells a lot of, of stories. There are about 150 um, sub-stories in the Mantarote, most of them told by the hupo bird who re responds to the talk of, of the birds. Um, and here I try to, to demonstrate or to show what the, um, yeah, what the structure of the Mantarote is. It's really a very structured work. Um, so it's the, there's the frame story itself, which consists of a prologue, the past towards God itself, and an epilogue. Um, and this prologue, um, Already in the Shahnameh, um, completed in 1010, but also in, in Islamis, um, Mahdavis, there is a structure to uh, a prologue or a debauche. Um, first, God is praised, and then there is a part of praise about Muhammad and the four rightly guided caliphs, or the imams, if the author is Shiite. Um, so these are two parts. The third part is the praise of, um, of the patron, and the fourth part is an explanation of why the author um, wrote his work. Well, in Atar's Mantarotev, but also in his other Masnavi poems, there are only the first two parts, the praise of God, and then the praise of Muhammad and the four rightly guided caliphs. He didn't include the praise of a patron. Uh, Atar himself explains that he doesn't work for patrons, so that's why it's not there. And um, yeah, the explanation of why he wrote this work kind of travels from the prologue to the epilogue, um, where Attar prompts the reader, or maybe also the listener, 
um, of, of his masonry. Um, to, to see beyond the beauty of the poem. It's a really beautiful poem, but he says, don't look so much at the beauty. Dive into it and try to, to feel the longing for God and yourself to become a Sufi on, on this path towards God. Um, yeah, so typical for the, the works of Attar is, this, is that this frame story is interspersed by... Um, by, by sub-stories. Um, we find them already um, in the prologue and in the epilogue, but they're especially prominent in the main part, the path towards the divine. First, the birds are introduced, 13 birds, and compared to prophets. And then there are three series of talks. And in the first series, the birds yeah, find excuses not to embark on the journey. This, this is also where we find this beauty of Attar, um, where he, for example, says, oh, the, the nightingale doesn't want to find God, the nightingale only wants to, to sing for the rose. And the falcon, a very royal symbol, says, I don't need another king, I, I have my worldly king, I only want to perch on the arm of, of the king. But then, in the end, they embark on the journey, and in the second series, the birds then find excuses or negative characteristics, saying we cannot continue on this, this journey. But finally, in the third series, um, they, they express yeah, or show positive characteristics. And the hoopoe has a very important function here, because after every speak, speech of a bird, he replies with a sub-story, um, a didactic sub-story often. Um, so one time after each bird here, or multiple times after each bird. And these, these sub-stories, they often um, relate to well-known stories of the Quran. It might be stories about Sufis, prophets, or well-known lovers. Um, and after the third series, they, they kind of go surpass seven valleys or stations on the mystical path, and then in the end, they unite with, with God, and the God is called Seymour. And this is the wonderful linguistical device of Atar, the Tajnis Atam, where 30 birds, Seymour in Persian, um, come to the Seymour. Seymour is represented here in a Chinese iconography, well established at the time this was painted, the end of the 15th century and they are not able to distinguish themselves anymore from, from the Seymour. So Seymour becomes Seymour. Um, they annihilate into um, unity with the divine, and it's of course very hard to, um, to imagine what that might be like, but Attar often used just this, this image, um, yeah, the, uh, a drop that emerges in the ocean and we cannot anymore distinguish the drop from the ocean. Yeah, so when I started my research on the on illustrated manuscripts of the Mantarote, I was not really the first one to, to look into the subject. Um, it all started out in 1963 when Ernst Gruber, then a curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, purchased this manuscript um, yeah, for the Metropolitan Museum. Um, yeah, it's a very high quality manuscript and now quite well researched. Produced in Herat in um, 1486, 87, and refurbished in Isfahan around 1600. Um, yeah, as as a gift or an endowment to the shrine of, of Sheikh Safi in in Arabil. So that's quite well known. Um, a manuscript in Krakow was published by Tadeusz Maida, and another manuscript in Turin um, was published uh, by uh, Pierre Montes, and also in uh, a facsimile edition was published in Tehran. And myself, I did some research on the Monteroté manuscript in, in Berlin. Um, but when I started out, it was not really this corpus yet of of illustrated manuscripts, so they hadn't been studied all together. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, and when thinking about illustrated manuscripts, it's also important to think about unillustrated manuscripts. Um, as many other Persian literary works, we don't have the original text of Attar, but um, two manuscripts um, date from the 13th century. They are both um, calligraphed by Ibrahim um, from Marokh, a city in the northwest of, of Iran, where he or maybe his family came from. And both of them are now in, in Konya, in the uh, Mevlevi Museum or the, the Mevlevi, in the ancient Mevlevi Sufi order. Um, their date is, in both cases, their dates are not well um, legible, um, but for the year 600, so they were produced in 600 something, which corresponds to the 13th century. And um, which surprised me in the beginning, because the Montrote itself is, is, is known as a work on its own, um, in these earliest manuscripts, we don't find the Montrote alone, but together with other um, yeah, Masnavis or texts by Attar. So we can call them a Thalesse, three works, um, in both cases, the Montalte, Asrarname, and, and Musibatname. Um, so these, these Kuliat manuscripts, or these collections of works of Attar, are the only works um, or manuscripts I found in the 13th and 14th century in which the, uh, the Mantarotter occurs. But starting from the early 15th century, we also find anthology manuscripts. This one is dated 1408 and based on its style, especially illumination called the blue and gold floral style. Um, it can be attributed to, to the city of Shiraz. And here we find works of Attar, but also of other authors, uh, Rumi and Sultan Balat. Um, so Shiraz appeared to be a very important city for the first illustrations of the Mantalte, and that is why I marked it with a very big dot over here, uh, amongst <coughs> other cities where the Mantalte was illustrated in the 15th century. Um, I found out that, yeah, in the first half and during the 15th century, the western half of Iran was the place where the Mantalte was illustrated, and only towards the end um, was also illustrated in the city of Herat, now in Afghanistan. Um, yeah, and this 15th century development can be subdivided further. Um, between 1410 and 1420, um, the Mantarote was illustrated in anthologies produced for the Timurid rulers Iskandar and Ibrahim, in both Shiraz and Isfahan, as um, their colophons point out. And um, anthologies then are these, these works with collections of texts by multiple authors, and they're quite luxurious. Um, this is an unillustrated um, manuscript, but you see a very rich illumination, a dedication to Iskandar um, in the central medallions and the table of contents around this, and then these blue and gold floral style typical for Shiraz. And um, yeah, as in these anthologies, there are many works that are illustrated. There are not that many illustrations to the Mantarote. But in anthologies produced for Iskandar, starting 1411, already a bit of a small um, illustrative cycle emerged. And looking at this cycle, it seems that the mystical path, and especially its end, the disappearance and the unity with God was, was emphasized. But this wasn't done by the illustration of the framework itself, but through those sub-stories told by the Hubo bird. And um, two images illustrate um, the long sub-story of Sheikh San'an, which occurs in a very important place in, in the Mantarote. It is towards the end of the first cycle, when the first series of speech, when the birds say, we don't want to go on, onto that journey. 
the Hupo tells the story of Sheikh San An, and then at the end they decide to embark on the journey. And the story um, itself is about a, a Muslim Sheikh who falls in love with a Christian girl. And um, yeah, in itself it also incorporates the, the, the mystical journey. So here Sheikh San An sees the Christian girl in her building, his students are there as well, and um, yeah, falls in love with her, which um, parallels the second valley of love, where the seeker on the path um, recognizes the, the love for God and knows nothing else than the love for God. Then the second illustration is also about the story of Sheikh San An, um, out of love for the, Christian, for the Christian girl, he first decides to drink wine and then he also converts to Christianity in a monastery. And he's seen over here, you see the conversion also changed what he looks like. He, uh, he has another hat, another garment and around his waist um, the belt of Christianity which also occurs in the text. And this conversion here is demonstrated by the Sheikh kissing the hand of a monk. Um, and this conversion co corresponds to the fourth valley of self-sufficiency, where one totally turns away from the person one had been before um, yeah, and goes to another direction. And the end of the journey um, is illustrated by means of another story, um, a dervish who fell in love with a prince, and when he finally hears the voice of the prince and sees him, he dies, which is this annihilation into divine unity. Um, good, so this was an anthology produced 1411, um, now in, in Lisbon, and what is kind of strange and also typical about anthologies produced for Iskander is that the works are always abbreviated. Um, you can still follow the stories, but the calligrapher or whoever decided about it left lines out. And this becomes more and more until it's just an excerpt. And this is an anthology um, now mounted in an album. It's dated 1413, also produced for, for Iskandar. And the whole Mantarote is now abbreviated or excerpted in the right hand column where there is a shorter version of the story of the dervish who fell in love with the prince. And it's combined with excerpts from two other um, works. Um, so in the middle, we see a part of a story of uh, Nizami's Mahsan al Azrar, the dog, the, the hunter, the dog, and the fox. And to the left, the wrestling of Rostam and Pulavand from the Shahnameh. And I think we can read this as a kind of iconography for Iskandar himself. Um, so if we start with the story in the middle, um, there's this is a story about a hunter who lost his dog, and then um, a fox comes and he's happy to be finally relieved from, from the dog and says to the hunter, don't go look for your dog, just, just be happy. Uh, but then the dog comes back and says to the fox, um, it took a while but now I'm back and you didn't know that I came as a lion. And this can in a way be related to Iskandar, who after the death of Timur tried and tried to become kind of the next ruler over the Timur Empire, but had to, to fight with his brothers and had to struggle and only after the death of his brother Pierre Muhammad, he was able to, to reign uh, first over Yazd and then Shiraz and Isfahan. Then another story to, to the left, um, yeah, the siege of of the lion-hearted Rostam over the Dev-like um, emperor of China, Pulavand, can also be related to Iskandar's sieges of Isfahan, for example, 1412, uh, Kerman and, and Rom, 1413. And then the illustration related to the Manta Altair doesn't seem to be related with Iskandar's worldly victories, but more with his search for the divine. So again, the dervish dying under the gallows when he sees the prince and hears the prince and then yeah, vanishes in this, this ocean 
of souls. So how is Iskandar related to this idea? Um, we know basically through um, written sources that Iskandar himself thought to be on, on this, this mystical path. Um, in a preface to a lost work, actually, the Jama as Sultani, or the Princely Son, um, is preserved here in Cambridge in a manuscript of um, Yazdi's Munshaat. And it tells that Iskandar was engaged with the science of unity, or the ilm tawhid and the science is also def defined as the Sufi's path towards knowledge about the divine. Um, Iskandar asks wise people in his environment, the Sufi Sheikh Nimatullah Vali and Sayyid Sharif Georgiani, about the meaning. What is it? What does unity mean? Um, in, a pre in the same preface to the Jama Sultani, uh, it says that Iskandar was granted the robe of the external but also the spiritual caliphate. And this kind of divine intervention also comes in in dedications to Iskandar in, in manuscripts and in um, building inscriptions where it says that Iskandar is the shadow of God. Finally, the historian Natanzi even has it that Iskandar is the messiah of the end of times, so adding, adding an eschatological dimension to this. So all together, taking these sources together, um, it seems that Iskandar, like the birds, thought that it was at least possible to, to unite with uh, God, but also use this in this preface and in dedications to kind of legitimize his role. So this, this page all seems to be kind of a propaganda for, for Iskandar. Yeah, so we now move to the middle of the 15th century when a pictorial cycle starts to be developed. Um, we still have anthologies and manuscripts that combine multiple works of Atar, but we also find the first manuscripts that only have the Mantarotheid in there, that also illustrates the Mantarotheid. The first one is dated 1438 and is now in, in Patna in the province Bihar in, in India. Um, yeah, so it is, it is difficult in this period to, to actually find out where exactly these manuscripts were produced. Um, the colophon mentioned, men mentioned dates and calligraphers, but only in one case, um, yeah, a place of production is called, and it was kind of a surprise for me, um, this is a manuscript in the, in the British Library, and it has a colophon in, in Uyghur uh, and in, in Turkish, or Turkic, although, of course, the text of the Mantarote is still in Persian and the Arabic script. And the colophon mentions that the manuscript was written in Deylaman, here, in the north, towards close to the Caspian Sea, dated 1458, and made for Shahrukh bin Amir Kiya al Husseini, who I could identify as a local ruler over Delaman. Uh, the illustrations actually were only executed under the Ottomans, but the illuminations are in a style which derives from the Shirazi blue and gold floral style. Um, after the death of um, Ibrahim in 1435, there were kind of all kinds of political difficulties. And it seems that these royal book workshops that had been there in Shiraz and in Isfahan didn't exist after 1435. So it seems that artists kind of spread out and um, it's only based on the style that the manuscripts of around the middle of the 15th century can be attributed to Western Iran, the Western part of Iran. Uh, it becomes better um, in the 1470s, um, when a new style was developed, which is called the um, um, the brownish style, it was it was a, a word coined by Turk Turkish art historians, and it was also adopted by Barbara Brand and, and used in English. And some of those manuscripts um, stayed in their colophones that have been produced in Shiraz. Something else that very, is very interesting in, in these manuscripts is that the colophones say 
that the calligrapher um, was called Sheikh Morshid. So a Sheikh, um, a Sufi leader, a Morshid is someone who teaches other Sufi, so really a Sufi master. And it seems that this Sufi master or these Sufi masters were also related with Khanagas or Sufi convents. And this frontispiece, to, um, so placed in front of the manuscript of uh, six works, allegedly all by Attar, um, yeah, gives the impression of a Sufi convent. We see here a Sufi master teaching students in an iwan or in a, uh, yeah, in a madrasa or Sufi order. Others play music and a Sufi is meditating here by the water. And to the left, um, we see a half-naked person, a kalandar or a, um, a wonder monk who is dancing on the, the tones of a, of a flute. Someone is playing a flute here. So it seems that multiple dimensions of Sufism are represented here. And placed at the very beginning of the book, it on the one hand seems to point in towards the book and to, to demonstrate multiple, yeah, aspects of Sufism that are addressed in the book itself, but it might also point outwards to actually the, the, the place where the manuscript might have been produced in, in the Sufi convent or where, where it might have been used. Um, so this is the first small indication of a production in uh, a Sufi convent. Later on we find more evidence for that. Good, so about the, the illustrations. Um, so there are 10 manuscripts in total, which, which I count to the middle of the 15th century. Um, they have illustrations, illustrations ranging from 1 to 13. Um, illustrate a total of 27 scenes, and 17 scenes occur more than once. So it seems that an, a cycle is being developed, but it's not quite there yet. And if we <coughs> look at the, um, the images themselves, here it's again Sheikh San'an um, falling in love with a Christian girl, a very, very popular scene. We see that kind of a similar composition is being composed with the building to the left and the Sheikh and his students standing in front of that to the right. Other illustrations of the same scenes can be quite differently or they have a different emphasis. Um, these are three illustrations um, about Joseph, like the Quranic or also biblical Joseph, um, who was sold in, in Egypt on the slave market. And Attar tells this story when the bird asks, asks about the pious zeal. What, what, what is that? And the pious zeal here um, concerns a lady who wants to buy Joseph um, by the threat she had spun herself. And that kind of seems ridiculous because people were offering five times the weight of, of Joseph in gold. Um, so all illustrations show the lady and also the seller of, of Joseph who kind of reclines the bit. Um, but as I said, they have another emphasis to the left the, the image, it, it seems to be located in, in an indoor market. In the middle, uh, it's really emphasized it's so much about Joseph's weight and five times the weight of, of him in, in gold that has to be paid um, yeah, to pur purchase him. And here, someone is enthroned who seems to be the, the effective buyer, Potiphar, who is actually not even mentioned in, in Attar's text. Um, yeah, in, in line with the idea that these manuscripts were produced in Sufi orders and also for the use by Sufis, the illustrations emphasize people that were important in, in Sufi cycles. So um, this is, for example, Halaj, the, uh, the Sufi who said, um, Al-Haq, I'm the real, I am God, and for that he, he was um, killed. Joseph, we've seen him already, is, is known as a very beautiful person in, in mysticism, who also in his beauty reflects the beauty of God. And this is a uh, yeah, famous couple, 
Mahmoud of Ghazna and his favorite um, beloved slave boy, Ayaz. And this is an interesting um, story because it, it, tells, it is about Ayaz telling Mahmoud, when you are present, um, I, I disappear. And this, this changes, this turns around the classical idea of, um, of a ruler in love with a slave boy because here the lover becomes the beloved and the other way uh, around. Good, so these images kind of follow the text very literally, depict them, really illustrate them, but there are other images that we find in the beginning of the manuscripts um, that seem to point at kind of the whole journey of the birds. Um, these are frontispieces, um, especially um, Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, but also which I call opening pages. Images that are found um, in the beginning of the text also illustrate um, the, the prologue. And these are images of the, uh, the ascension of the Prophet Muhammad to the right in two Mantrote manuscripts. Um, but Attar, he doesn't tell the whole story of how Muhammad was, was brought the, uh, the steed Burak by Gabriel and ascended to, into heavens to finally meet God and to speak to God. He only refers to that because his readers knew the, the whole story, which is narrated in uh, Miraj Nalme um, literature, so in ascension literature. And this image already existed of Muhammad ascending into the heavens, so it kind of was taken and transported to the, um, to the Mantarote. And the reason, therefore, also seems to be that in, in Sufism, this ascension of, of the Prophet Muhammad was also related to the Sufi path. Um, I didn't talk about pseudo Atars yet. Uh, a pseudo Atar is someone who calls himself Atar but isn't the real Atar. And one of those pseudo Atars says that Ar Maromata Tuyur, the conference of the birds, is as the ascension of the soul to the bird of love. So this idea, this is ascension towards God, is also the, the, the journey of the birds. And the finding of the sea morgue. So in a way, these images try to um, maybe summarize the, the, the whole whole journey and also place at the beginning already to prefigure the, the end of the um, unity with the divine. Good, then we come to the end of the 15th century. Um, and yeah, there we find um, illustrations in a style which is um, called the Turkmen style. It is very um, recognizable. They're kind of squat people, repetition in landscapes and buildings. And I think you can see for yourself in these two images, illustrations of Sheikh Sanan falling in love with a Christian girl, how, how repetitive these, these images are. It's not only in the Mantarote itself, it's also between manuscripts that we find repetitions of the same compositions and iconography. To the left are two Mantarote manuscripts. Um, here it's about love, and um, the Hupo tells the story of Majnun, who was crazily in love with Leila, um, and wanted to see her, but, but couldn't, and he asked a, a shepherd, can you please give me a sheep's skin, and I can hide um, in your herd, and in the herd, we can go to, to, to Leila's encampment um, and he can see her and smell her. Also, smell is very important here. Um, so we see Majnun here um, amongst the herd. Uh, yeah, very similar arrangement with tents, Leila and um, the shepherd. This is an, an illustration of a, uh, a short poem by, by Jami composed towards the end of the 15th century. And in only one line, he refers to the same story of Attar, knowing that his readers know this story. So he, he just refers to it. Um, but the painters, they understood this. And they inserted the same image, probably coming from the Mantrote, at that place. Um, 
Yeah, so how is it possible that these images are so repetitive? Um, we know multiple manuscripts illustrated in this style that in the Kurilfon say they were produced in, in Shiraz. And sometimes it's thought that this was a, a commercial production of manuscripts, also because they don't have a, a patron in them. But other colophones, including this colophon of a Mont Altair manuscript, also point out that these manuscripts were produced in a Sufi order. Um, we have, again, a calligrapher who calls himself Sheikh Murshid ad-Din, so a Sufi master, and it was made at the place of the Abu Ishaqiyya of the Musalla of Shiraz. The Abu Ishaqiyya was the Sufi order, um, and this particular place, the Musalla, um, or an open place for prayer in Shiraz, where this, this was produced. So it seems that these Sufi orders also had a very important role in calligraphing and also illustrating mystical works that they might use themselves for education, but maybe also sold to others for the maintenance of the, the Sufi orders. And we can imagine that if there is this, this production of multiple manuscripts at one place, um, yeah, that the illustrations also very much look alike. Um, there is also more of an, um, a cycle, a pictorial cycle developed. Uh, in the middle of the 15th century, we had a total of 27 um, illustrations of the Mantarote. These become less in the uh, manuscripts produced in Shiraz at the end of the 15th century. Um, and we see that some of them really appear in, in multiple manuscripts, or most of them actually. Um, they don't have this kind of opening images, or maybe only the adoration of, of Adam. Um, they, most of them illustrate sub stories, so again, not that many uh, illustrations of the, the, the frame story. Um, we find multiple kings, kings shooting apples from the servant's head, Mahmud and Ma Masud, the um, Presnavid um, kings. Then there are lovers, Majnun and Sheikh Sanan. Sheikh Sanan is, is, is very popular. Three scenes are illustrated and the encounter with the Christian girl um, four times. Um, so we don't have that many frontispieces that kind of epitomize the, the mystical journey, but this function is taken by the only illustration of the framework, the conference of the birds, where the hoopoe bird tells the other, other birds, um, there is a king, we need a king, let's go look for the king. So that is um, plays quite at the beginning, of course, of the mystical journey, but the manuscript here to the left already represents the scene work, so the end of the journey is also prefigured in, in this case. Good. After about 1500, um, production of illustrated manuscripts of the Mantra they spread out. Um, it's the end of the Timurid Empire, the end of the Turkmen uh, dynasties, and other dynasties come up, and the Mantarote is illustrated in Turkey, in um, Central Asia, and in India. But it is not like the 15th century that it could find real groups of manuscripts. Um, it's, it's one here, one there, and it's very difficult to see, see trends. Um, but in Iran, another trend comes up towards the end of the 17th century, and this is this illustration or representation of the substory of Sheikh, Sheikh San'an outside of, um, of manuscripts. This, um, so this is a painting signed by the famous um, painter Mohammed Zaman, dated 1676. It was originally a separate leaf, but it became later mounted into an album, which we can see by this, this frame with, with the flowers on top of it. Um, so this is the scene after um, Sheikh Sanan told the Christian girl that he loves her, and she says, well, before you can win my heart, you first have to um, convert to Christianity, no, drink wine, burn the Quran, um, and, and shut your eyes.
for, for Islam. And the first thing he does is drinking wine. And according to Attar, this, this, this takes place in the monastery. Um, not in the vision of Muhammad Zaman, but he adds this, this Christian aspect to it, that is his monk with a cross in his hand, standing behind the Christian girl and her servant. And the Christian girl offers a, yeah, a bowl, a cup of wine to the sheikh who is kneeling in front of her. And then he has on his side two, two Muslims, probably um, two, two students of his, who want to, yeah, who want to keep the sheikh from, from drinking wine. Well, one very typical thing for uh, paintings produced by Mohammed Zaman is um, European influence or, yeah, uh, European style and European iconography. <coughs> and we see this um, style, for example, in the gradual recession, in the landscape, um, the, yeah, the fading of colors, and also the, the use of, of shadings in the landscape and in the figures to give them volume. And the iconography can be seen in some figures, um, Mohammed Azaman copied European um, images almost one to one, but sometimes he also just used one element and inserted, inserted it into his, his own context. And I think that's, that's what's happening here. Uh, Mohammed Azaman was active at the, uh, the court in, in Isfahan, and we know that multiple portraits and uh, prints reach, reached Isfahan in the 17th century. And um, yeah, one of them was a portrait, we know that, from sources of Queen Henriette Maria, who you see here. We don't know exactly which portrait was there in, in Isfahan, but we might imagine that it looked something like this painting by Anthony van Dyck, uh, with a very lavish dress, um, pearls around her neck, and her ears, and curly brown hair, which is kind of slick back in a, in a bun here. So this Henrietta Maria image um, was adopted for the Christian girl and we also clearly see that Mohammed Zaman exaggerated the very low-cut dress of, of Henrietta Maria by showing the Christian girl and her uh, servant yeah, as bare-breasted. So the Christian girl comes from Anatolia or room in um, in Attar's story, but for Mohammed Zaman, it was more important to to represent her as as a European lady, and it's probably because the idea of a European woman was related with the idea of eroticism. So the yeah Christian girl was Europeanized, eroticized. And Mohammed Azamon did at also in other instances, this is a, a, an illustration from the Khamsa of Nizami, the king Turktazi visiting Turktaz, the queen of fairies. And the queen of fairies was a Turkish lady um, in Nizami, but she is again represented as a European woman, um, probably also to show how erotic she is. It's really a very erotic story um, about the king who goes to um, yeah, the, the magical garden of the fairies and is seduced by the fairies and they kiss a bit and they hug a bit but then the, the fairies don't want, want to sleep with him and um, yeah so the, the Turkish fairy is then represented as a European woman I would say to show how erotic she is well, especially in the 19th century, we find many uh, paintings of Sheikh Sanan and the, and the Christian girl, um, where the Christian girl is represented as a European lady. Here, even, it's a kind of reclining Venus. And it's not anymore an illustration of one particular part of the story. Um, here, it's more that Sheikh Sanan indulges in, the, in, in kind of European par paradise with multiple women, a man, and also a mini version of the, uh, the Christian girl. And we also know this yeah, perception of, 
of the West from written sources. The Qajar prince uh, Kuli Mirza traveled to London and went to a theater and yeah, there looks at, at, at the singers and musicians who produce cheerful tones that make the hearts of the poor restless and impatient. And then he says the sight of the elegance and coquettishness of the charming ladies made thousands to lose faith, just like Sheikh Saman. So losing faith because of seeing European women becomes kind of a trope um, in painting and in, um, in text. And Kuli Mirza even uh, yeah, produces a verse saying, the vine, the vine of your locks is the trap of disbelief of faith. And her picture house is a proof of this. So it even seems that these images were produced um, as a vehicle to, to represent the Iranian perception of the uh, erotic um, West. But at the same time, um, Armenian Christians also had another interpretation of the story of Sheikh Sanan. Um, this tile panel is now in the Armenian Museum in, in Isfahan. Um, probably comes from Armenian context, um, maybe from one of the churches, um, Armenian churches in Isfahan of, or from Armenian houses. And we see Sheikh Sanan represented um, in front of a church. And the thing he is doing here is probably burning the Quran. This was one of the things that Sheikh Sanan had to do. Um, well, one of the assignments that he was given by the Christian girl in the month of day, but in the end, he doesn't do it. In this version, he is burning the Quran. And we also know that from um, a lacquer mirror box, where Sheikh Sanan bur burns the Quran, um, and we see a lot of emotion here. Um, so the parts of the Christians, they are happy, and, and the Christian girl even embraces uh, Sheikh Salman, whereas in the Muslim side, uh, people are crying, she is, is pulling her hair. But in the Armenian tile panel, there is no one is really sad. Um, here we see some astonishment by uh, students of the Sheikh who are tending swine, who put their finger on their lips in astonishment, seeing this, this burning of the Quran. So, I didn't look at my script much. To conclude, <laughs> um, there cannot be one answer to the question why the Man Mantalte was illustrated. Um, Atar's anthologies show his personal past towards the divine and also function as a, uh, yeah, a way of propaganda, a legitimation of his own rule. And later 15th century uh, illustrations emphasize a genuine interest in the mystical path in manuscripts of which some might have been produced in, in Sufi orders and also for use and ed education of Sufis. In the early modern period, the Christian girl is eroticized and brought in relationship with the Iranian vision of Europe and European women, but the Armenians might well have picked up the story for another reason, to represent Christianity's superiority over Islam. Thank you for your attention. Okay, what's the next most popular? Um, I don't have the tables for everything. Well, Joseph becomes kind of popular. The Dervish, it, it, the earliest illustration of the Dur Dervish were, yeah, they were there already in the first illustrated manuscript, so that is, is repeated. But it's it's basically Sheikh San An, who was also illustrated in, in, in Hafez and in Magellan yeah. Solution. Yeah. It, it's strange that the birds don't become that <laughs> that much illustrated. Sometimes, also in in Arishia Nawai, but it's it's basically the the sub stories, um, and there might be multiple reasons for that. <laughs> um, you focused on the fifteenth century uh -huh. and after. 
which I gather from the preamble that we were sent, is because there isn't anything, as far as we know, before that. Um, yes, true. And I, a, a, is that, am I interpreting what, what I've read correctly? But B, why? Mm -hmm. um, do you have some theories on this? Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so in the uh, thing I wrote, I said the, the Schonomer was illustrated mm -hmm. from around 1300. We have um, an early illustrated manuscripts from, from Nizami. 1318 in, in Tehran, although Nizami is becomes more and more illustrated um, starting from the end of the of the 14th century. Um, I think especially well the Shahnameh, why was the Shahnameh illustrated? This is one big <laughs> big question. And um, answers that scholars have, have given is well it's it's a book about kings and especially rulers want to relate themselves to to that. Um, maybe it's also easier to illustrate because there's a, there's a lot of action, things going on, whereas the Montalte, it's, well, it's, it's a mystical work, it's, it's difficult. Um, so, one part of my question would be that I think Iskandar, um, this Timurid ruler, was very interested in that work and maybe if he or people working for him hadn't started to illustrate the work, it, it would never have been illustrated. Um, we also see some exchange of images. I think especially Nizami um, illustrations have a huge impact on, on the illustrations of the Mantalte. So maybe other things had to go first before it was possible to illustrate mm -hmm. the Mantalte. It's a sort of spin-off. Yeah, maybe, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, you were talking about the scandal. Yeah. And, uh, and these beautiful um, pictures of um, Dervish dying and they had just Yes. Well, so do, do you think um, Iskandar is, uh, we've got two allegories, two, two sus suspects. Is he a Dervish or he's a prince? Ooh. <laughs> he. Uh, and why, why are they so yellow? I'm sorry. Oh, yes, but that's also the reproduction of the top puppet. It's <laughs> unfortunate. <laughs> um, <clears throat> is Iskandar a prince or a derwish? Um, I think Iskandar also had to come up with new ways to, to be a ruler. Um, he, Timur looked at Genghis Khan and, and, and related him to. Yeah, to, to the Ilkhanids. I think Iskandar was trying to come up with, with new ideas, or maybe the circle around him. And, well, the written sources say this was Sufism. Mm -hmm. Whether he was really a Dervish or whether it was a strategy, I don't know that. But maybe both. Because maybe both. Because we have Seymour. Yeah. And we don't really have 30 birds. Mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. only 30, just something generic. <laughs> so maybe both sort of. Yeah, yeah, because um, well, there are four anthologies of his that are illustrated with uh, scenes from the uh, Mantarote, but the text itself occurs in mm -hmm, eight or nine anthologies. So he was, he was really, or people around him at least were really kind of yeah. fond of it. Yeah. He must have been uh, aware of his name as well. I mean, of course, it's <coughs> yeah. a trivial point, but I mean, it's very convenient if you're. Or the scandal, so yeah. think about a real scandal, as it were. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was. Scandal, which obviously combined yeah. rulership and the sort of Sufi quest as well, at least has presented at the end. Yeah, and they are also illustrated um, in, the, yeah, in the anthologies. I think Paolo had a question. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry, I'm not really familiar with the whole um, you know, illustration of the same or. Mm -hmm. It's become this majestic color. Yeah. But um, according to what I remember from Antikotai, that it's the 30 birds that sees their own reflection, right? Yeah. Uh, or, yeah. It's more or less they don't, like a, they cannot recognize they themselves like, or mm -hmm. they cannot tell themselves apart from. Yeah, so the there's a, a, a bigger space for interpretation, you know, when it comes to painting, mm -hmm. how to, you know, project that thing. Yeah. And we, we just saw that there are only two or one painting that you show with birds, actual birds, yeah. and then the Seymour appearing. So there is this ironic situation where you really don't 
know what the same ought to look like. But yeah, mm -hmm. and also maybe that's why it limits the the artist or the painter to really imagine mm -hmm. how those how to depict that thirty birds one, at one time. Yeah, that makes it more significant because it's the maybe the characteristics of the thirty birds in collective and integration that Rick design cannot be depicted mm -hmm. possibly mm -hmm. speaking. But the other aspect of the human relation with this Sheikh Sena, they can be depicted very easily. So I don't know what is there, the, the whole philosophical transformation or the whole idea that mm -hmm. comes across painting. Yeah. Um, well, you're very right. There is a problem in how to represent uh, this annihilation into divine unity. I mean, Attar himself has has problems speaking about it. He tries to imagine that, and then he says, no, stop, Atari, you cannot speak about that. You, have, you haven't reached that yet. So I certainly see why illustrators would have a problem um, sure. illustrating that. The image of the Seamark itself is, is not a problem, because we have the Seamark in the Charlemagne, sure. um, in other works, but especially in the Charlemagne, it was illustrated. And, often as this Chinese Feng Huang bird, but sometimes also as a rooster or uh, another kind of bird. <laughs> and um, so representing the sea moik itself was not the problem, but the problem, as, as you say, is, is this, oh, 30 birds seeing the sea moik don't know whether it's God or themselves. And, and um, that is probably also why the illustrations focused, focused that much on um, yeah, on the, on the sub story, I came across an um, an Indian, probably Dekani, seventeen eighteenth century manuscript that was not um, initially illustrated, but there are these headings, and so it's often oh, bird X Y says, and then Hupo answers or birds talking, and there was also a problem there with the word word mork because they wanted to illustrate all those birds, so the Hupo looks like like a hoopo, but if it says mork, they thought it means chicken. So this whole manuscript is full of chicken. <laughs> yeah, so it seems to be more an Indian thing. Sorry, it's a Nassim had a question, or? I don't know. I have two questions, if I may. One about the image, one about the text, but I think the first one might be quick. I wanted to ask about the birds and when they're represented. Are there, are there, is there any indication that the the painters knew about the text specifically to paint a specific bird, or know about the personifications of the birds? Because I'm thinking of later Mughal mm -hmm. paintings where birds are basically decorations and they're just animated around True. on the borders. Yeah. And then the, my second question is exactly about this anthology, where you yeah. said that the text is becoming shorter. Yeah. Is this is this a progression of the text of the anthology because it starts earlier on? Mm -hmm. it, is the text getting shorter and shorter when you compare the stories? Have you done that? Yes. Okay, to see if it's if it's really becoming shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. So in the time of for the second question, in the time of Iskandar, they become shorter and shorter. Um, it's also anthologies are or Iskandar's anthologies are very complicated. I don't have a good image of that, um, but in other manuscripts. You have, say here in the central area there is a text and another text is running around that. Yes. And the book artist really wanted the two works to stop at the same time and two new works to begin at the, at the same page. Yes. So they also needed to be a bit flexible in, yeah, in, in the text and to eliminate some, some lines and uh, leave single verses out so it, it, it would all fit. Um, yes, so this anthology and another one also dated around 1413 in, um, in where is it, Rampur in India. They only pick some sub-stories and really abbreviate them or, so that you can, you can maybe only follow it really if you know the story. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems also that, or maybe that the these texts in relation to Iskandar try to use the text for him to have a kind of message in relationship with him. Mm. 
But under Ibrahim, there is only this one yes. uh, anthology in Berlin. Um, it was calligraphed by the same calligraphers who were working for Iskandar, and there the text is complete. So they knew the complete text. It was not that it became shorter and shorter um, on itself. Um, also comparing the abbreviated texts, they're always, always abbreviated in a different way. So it seems they really had um, complete manuscripts mm -hmm. to, yeah, at the book workshop or where they were working. And and choose one. Yeah. Of course, that would be an interesting point. Which ones were yeah. reduced the most? I mean, or even yeah. left out completely? And what the mm -hmm. emphasis would then be if it's the same as the emphasis yeah. you know, which is given by the picture? It, yeah, it also seems the, the abbreviations are more, in this case, in the beginning. So the text around the image is more or less complete. So you know what the image is, okay. is, is depicting. Um, the other questions about the birds. Yes, um, so it, yes, it seems the most Indian thing to do. I don't have that many, I only have two Indian manuscripts. Um, and they do depict birds, um, often around the, the titles. They are not inside of the text, but they are around the text in the margins. <laughs> in both cases, it seems to show that they were added later. Yeah. Well, Jeff, just, I'm going to ask, you mentioned that the other works, other works of Atar or his Masnadi, mm -hmm. um, in some of the anthologies, did they also develop on their own any of the works in terms of illustration? Um, very few of them. I only know, know two anthologies that also have or, yeah, these kind of combined works uh, of Atar that have illustrations. So I cannot really answer the question because there's not enough material to... So, I mean, they did the, the, those individual works yeah. didn't take off on their own? Oh, didn't take off on their own. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, Ilahi Naamed, for example. Ilahi Naamed, yes. Do you have... Uh, there are separate yes. um, okay. manuscripts, but... I cannot tell you when the first Elahinome or the first Esrarnome occurs as a separate manuscript. But maybe not as pos popular as the Antiquity. I don't think as popular as the Antiquity. Yes, some of them were. I, I only know it in Kuliat manuscripts that if the Montarote is illustrated, other works are illustrated. So. so we can really go to, to draw portraits of Rebecca and Dania. <laughs> yes. If we had an illustration, I would love to have illustrations of Rabia, but unfortunately, it didn't come across. Of course, one way of being the birds uh, would have been to have a great big fat chicken or whatever you like. Yeah. Seaborg, and then inside is all the other birds. Wow, you know, yes. I suppose, um, you know, elephants with people. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's true. So, I don't know when that, they started doing that. Of course, it figures. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very yeah. yeah. so it been quite cunning. <laughs> so they all into one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm not from Nepal, so if this is a stupid question, I apologize beforehand. But stupid question. Were all these manuscripts supposed to be, what were they produced to be read? Were they also gifts? In special occasions, were they commissioned to display power from the person committing them? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very good question. Um, I thought about the, the anthologies for, for Iskandar because there's so many produced in a very short period of time that maybe they were meant to be gifted. Um, the problem is that there is no evidence. There, mm -hmm. We don't have any in, in those manuscripts any note, okay, I received this as a, as a gift. Um, the one in the Metropolitan Museum um, was probably not created as a gift, but was then bestowed, or given to uh, the shrine of Sheikh Safi um, by um, Shah Abbas the first. So, hmm, I think that many of them were actually meant for for education, for reading. Um, we know of sessions, people coming together. We know that they handed around manuscripts and, and, and looked at the illustrations. Um, but again, there is no 
evidence for it. <laughs> Can I just ask, you mentioned the Vagelis of the Shed. <laughs> yes. What are the uh, scenes illustrated in uh, two or three of those? I mean, in the, the Etta part. Um, and they also uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare and, and, and the Dervish. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's so interesting that in the Magellus of Shak Shakespeare is treated as, as, as one of, mm. of, of the Sufis. Yeah. yeah. I guess we can't have 30 verse because we don't have enough profit. True, yes, yeah, yeah, we only have 30. It's, it's interesting, there are only 13 birds and then combined with 13 prophets. Um, in this, so, people have tried to make 30 birds out of this, but there are definitely 13 in the introduction and 11 and 11, so it mm. also doesn't add up to, to 30. But I don't know whether actually these 13 birds are... I mean, they are named, these are specific words, but then it's yeah. just bird one, yeah. bird two, and yeah. There's another question. Yeah. I have a question about the uh, going of the Quran. If you did not actually happen in this story, why would they not? Hmm. Apart from the Armenian, like the Qajars, for example. Yeah, well, um, go to the end. Um, maybe it was a very Isfahani thing. So we had the Armenians representing that. Playing hmm, shakes on, uh, burnt the Quran. Um, this one, this lacquer box, uh, on the inside of, of the lid, there is a representation of Muhammad, uh, Ali, Hassan, and Hussein. So it's it's a bit strange. You cannot really argue, oh, this was a Christian uh, mirror box. Um, maybe the the image was around. We've seen images moving from one place to another and maybe it was adopted without the the idea, the Armenian idea. So it is as yeah. if the image came like life of its own, mm -hmm. apart from the text. Life of its own, I think that's, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very good way to say it. Is this so called going back to my PhD dissertation? Oh yes. <laughs> Many years ago. Um, there is a hadith about um, the uh, ayat about Harut and Marut. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, there is a uh, horrible woman who tried to seduce the uh, pious angels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, two angels, of course there were three originally, but the third one just got discarded immediately. But these two, when they got to the point when they uh, were given the conditions mm -hmm. uh, or on, on which she could be theirs. Uh, so one was burning the Quran, uh -huh. one was drinking wine, and it, it, it had, they had to choose. They, they didn't have to do all, all three of them. Okay, they had to choose. So, mm -hmm. so burning the Quran, drinking wine, and killing the innocent baby. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they chose the most innocent. Yes. Drinking wine. <laughs> <laughs> so after they drank the wine, they, they did, well, I mean, all, all yeah. two of them. But the, killing the innocent babies. No, there is worshipping idols, which I forgot, which is one of the... So it's also a bit strange. The Christian girl says, burn the Quran, drink wine, worship idols, and yeah, don't look at Islam or look away from, from Islam. What he does is he drinks wine, he converts to Christianity, and he tends swine. Mm. So it's, it's a bit strange, something <laughs> changed there. <laughs> yeah. But thank you for the wine drinking. Yeah. Sorry, and I just no, sorry. thought about the whole concept of fire that within the Greek myth as well as in Zoroastrianism, mm -hmm. the fire itself is an element that immortalizes anything. You know, for example, in Greek mythology, the baby is kept in the fire so mm -hmm. the baby can be immortalized. I don't know how is the here is represented, but but you know, the fire is more. For example, if you throw it in the water, the water carries away, but it. it it becomes decayed. Mm -hmm. It doesn't die, but it's half, you know, material and half decaying. Mm -hmm. But in the fire, it completely destroys itself. So yeah. that's another form of, you know, kind of different True. formation. True. Yes. Well, there's also. Learn. So I don't know. I think there are a lot of interpretations of the depiction of fire that can True. suggest yeah. it, that it might be one of the most innocent act. I don't know. But yeah. It may well, not actually be destructive. Maybe the Quran can just not be burned, I don't know. <laughs> no, yeah. 
I just had the yeah. idea. <laughs> yeah, but there is, of course, also the, the image of the, the, the moth going to the, to the fire. Yeah. And it's destructive. <laughs> yeah, so maybe on that note we can we can end it here. And we can, uh, please join me in thanking Ilsa for a wonderful talk and um, for uh, an interesting discussion afterwards. So thank you, Ilsa. Thank you.